Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so today's talk will be mostly logically independent of the other one. The other one I discussed some theoretical aspects of tensors. And today I'm just going to talk about applications. I will primarily just talk about one application to the complexity of matrix multiplication. And if time permits, I may discuss a few others to quantum information theory and other things that haven't been mentioned as much as uh, certain applications. So let's get going. And um, the story begins in 1968. Uh, Strassen uh, thought about multiplying matrices. Now the standard way we multiply matrices, if we do row column, uh, if this is an n by n matrix, you have to do n multiplications and n minus one additions to find that entry. There are n squared um, entries in our matrix. So you do on the order of n cubed arithmetic operations to multiply to n by n matrices. And Strassen said, well, this algorithm is great. It's been around for ages. Um, let me make sure that it's the best algorithm. He actually set out to prove that you could not do better than this. So how is he going to do that? Well, obviously for arbitrary n, you can't possibly hope to do that. So he said, okay, let me just try and do it for two by two matrices. But even for two by two matrices, how are you going to check all possible algorithms for multiplying them? Well, if you work over a finite field, say with two elements, then this is actually possible. And so he began enumerating all possible algorithms for multiplying two by two matrices over a field with two elements. And he failed to attain his goal. What he instead found was this. Now, the only thing you need to understand about this slide that's really important is that you get the product of this matrix and this matrix by doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven multiplications instead of the usual eight. Now, it's unfortunate that there's more additions, but I'll talk about that later. So you can verify that this works in the privacy of your own home. Uh, I don't recommend trying to do it during the talk, but uh, during the course of this talk, you will see that we could have predicted that such an algorithm must exist. But there is something I want you to notice about this algorithm that we're only adding and multiplying the entries of the matrix to do this. There's no division or anything fancy. So in particular, the entries of this matrix need not be numbers. They could be, in fact, elements of any algebra, but in particular, they could be matrices themselves. So instead of multiplying two by two matrices, you could multiply four by four or eight by eight or 16 by 16 matrices using the same algorithm iteratively. And when you do this, you only use seven to the K multiplications, which if you ever dealt with big numbers, you know is a whole lot less than eight to the K. And what turns out is some good luck that although the initial algorithm had more additions, the growth rate of this additions under this iteration is dominated by the multiplications. And so you're really only doing on the order of seven to the K arithmetic operations. Any questions? Okay. So, and you, by rounding off and stuff, you can multiply N by N matrices with on the order of N to the 2.81, that's two log seven log base two of seven arithmetic operations. And this started a whole new field of inquiry because you could ask, well, he found this, but maybe we can do even better. And a lot of people worked hard over a 20 year period 
from 68 to 88 that said, in fact, you can do a lot, lot better. And back then, you can imagine their optimism that this that this was, and, and each of these, Beanie, Schoenhaga, Strassen, et cetera, each of these lowered this um, number of arithmetic operations, and you could hope that this would have continued. Now, of course, you can't expect it to go below n squared because there's n squared entries in your matrix, but it led them at the time, and many people still believe it, to this astounding conjecture that as your matrices get large, it becomes almost as easy to multiply them as it is to add them together or even just read the data. That is for any epsilon greater than zero, you can multiply n by n matrices using just a little bit more than n squared arithmetic operations. Any questions? So I have to say that when I first heard about this astounding conjecture, I used to think of it as a ridiculous conjecture, but I've gotten uh, a lot more humble since then, at least with respect to this conjecture. And then something funny happened. The, after that, for another 20 years, there was no progress whatsoever. And then in, in, a, in a short four or five year period, a whole bunch of people lowered like the last digit, the, the fourth digit, not the last digit, of course, but the fourth digit, and not by much. So I wanna talk about the geometry about this and its relation to tensors. So let me change language a little bit. So we have an n by n matrix. So it has n squared entries. That is, it's a point in a vector space of dimension n squared. So I'll just let capital N be that. And matrix multiplication is a bilinear map. You eat one matrix, you eat a second matrix, and then it spits out the product. In other words, matrix multiplication can be thought of as a tensor. We saw tensors, like Heng explained to us, that tensors are bilinear maps from two vector spaces to a third, for example, three, order three tensors. Now, your homework exercise. Um, if you write matrix multiplication as a trilinear map, something that eats three matrices and spits out a number, if it eats matrices X, Y, and Z, it just spits out the trace of their product. So when you get bored later in, this later in this talk, you should prove this exercise if you haven't done so already. Now, we talked about tensor rank. And a, that is a, a tensor of the form, you know, like A tensor, B tensor, C. A general tensor is a sum of terms like that. And if you have a rank one tensor and you consider it as a bilinear map, it corresponds to a bilinear map that can be computed using just one scalar multiplication. Looks like there's a question. Giorgio? Yeah, there is a question by Please, uh, Edina. Yeah, so thank you. So I wanted to ask a clarification here. So if we think about this tensor, what is the underlying group action here? Is it also GLN uh, acting on each one of the vector spaces? Well, I haven't talked about group actions yet. So let's take the definition of a tensor as a bilinear map. In what will be happening is there'll be several groups, all general linear groups. So this space of tensors is acted on by the change of bases in the first factor, the change of bases in the second factor, and the change of bases in the third factor. That is to say three copies of GLN. So- right. And is um, there any technical difficulties with restricting ourselves to 
field with two elements or the arguments extend to arbitrary fields? So yes, so good point. So Strassen's algorithm, he originally wrote it down for matrices taking values in the field of two elements. And then he observed that this algorithm actually worked over any field. But he only observed that after the fact. You know, he started out in field with two elements, and then he got very excited when he realized he could lift it to, well, I don't know if he got excited because he's Swiss, but he, got, he, he realized he was able to lift it to any field because as I said, it only involved addition and multiplication. Anything else? Good. Other questions? Okay, so now in terms of, instead of a mathematical point of view on tensor rank, we now have an algorithmic point of view of tensor rank. That is to say a rank one tensor corresponds to a bilinear map that can be computed using just one scalar multiplication. And the rank of a tensor is essentially the number of scalar multiplications needed to compute the corresponding bilinear map in an optimal algorithm. Now, the reason I use the word essentially is it depends what model you're using, whether you're using arithmetic circuits or whatever. But let's just say that no matter what model you use, this rank governs the number of scalar multiplications and therefore the number of arithmetic operations needed to compute the corresponding bilinear map. In, the, in a precise sense of computer science that I'm not going to get into the details. Ooh. Okay, so if we wanted to write the matrix multiplication operation as a tensor, it would look something like this, where instead of using a single index one up to n squared, I'm taking advantage of the matrix structure and giving each vector two indices, so it looks like a, entries of a matrix. And Strassen's presentation as a tensor looks like this. So there's four terms, and then I wrote Z3 dot that last bottom thing. Now that Z3 dot that last bottom thing means you take that and then you cyclically permute, you put Zs in the role of X, X in the role of Y, and Y in the role of Z, and then you do another cyclic permutation. So that's a sum of three terms. Now already this indicates that there's some finite group of interest going on. But for those of you who are experts, I can give you a challenge problem that you can actually do much better than this. If you use a group, not just Z3, but Z3 semi-direct product Z2, you can write this algorithm or this presentation as a union of two orbits. The first uh, term corresponds to a, a, a trivial representation of Z3 semi-direct Z2, and the other, the other six are just a single orbit of that group. So for those of you who are experts in board, I, there's a challenge question for you. Any questions for me? Okay. So Let's be precise, Strassen actually proved that the matrix multiplication operation can be computed using on the order of n to the tau arithmetic operations if and only if the tensor rank of this matrix multiplication tensor as a function of the size of the matrices grows like n to the tau. So that is a, a, a precise theorem and that enables us to rephrase the astounding conjecture. Let's let omega denote the infimum of the rank growing to order n to the tau for some tau. And that's called the exponent of matrix multiplication. Question. Jayama Edina has another question. Yeah, so Please. I wanted to know, is there any direct connection here or any reason to suspect whether the border rank for these tensors matches the rank? Is this tensor? I will answer that later in the talk. I don't want to discuss it right now. Sure, thank you. Sorry. 
No, I, I, I'm very happy you asked because I'm going to call on you in the quiz. <laughs> A second question by Giro. So, um, Giro. yeah, thanks, um, thanks, um, JM. So, so the rank here is just the standard CP rank, right? Yes, CP rank. So we're rank, just talking exactly. about the standard CP. Yes. Because you said earlier there's some kind of algorithmic notion that. But, uh, well, there are notions in computer science that are phrased in terms of circuits. So it's a different world. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying, no, and, and then they have other notions too. And I'm saying no matter what definition you want to use from computer science as your measure of complexity, mm -hmm. tensor rank does the job. Thanks, that's clear. Okay, so this exponent of matrix multiplication, now that we have this language, we see that the classical algorithm for multiplying matrices shows that omega is at most three. And the a corollary of Strassen's algorithm says that omega is at most log two of seven. And our astounding conjecture is that omega is two. Can't be less than two because of the dimensions. Now, I want to, you to think about this conjecture as a conjecture in geometry. We have a point, the matrix multiplication tensor in the space of all n squared by n squared by n squared tensors. And we want to know, does it lie on a secant R plane to the set of tensors of rank one? But let's forget about geometry for the moment. I want to give you a little history. So um, Dario Bini told me a story. I had the privilege of meeting him once about uh, what I'm going to tell you. And uh, so, what he was trying to do with his collaborators was if you take the usual two by two matrix multiplication tensor and one of the matrices you feed it has an entry set equal to zero, then when you try to multiply with the naive algorithm, you use six multiplications. And he said, well, maybe we could do that operation with five instead of six. And he, he had reasons for that I don't want to get into, but he just was trying to do that. And since he was very good at numerics and stuff for 1978, he wanted to do it on a computer. And he had some code that has been mentioned a little bit in these tutorials of kind of starting at a random uh, rank five tensor and trying to move it towards this sort of zeroed out uh, matrix multiplication tensor. And his code appeared to have a problem. See, what was happening when he did it is they could get close to a rank five tensor, but as they started to get close to the rank five tensor, the, the coefficients were starting to blow up. And now the first quiz question, what was wrong with their code? I'll give you a hint. It's a trick question. <laughs> Giorgio, you can call on someone who's... Yeah, Jago wants, okay, I don't know I if he wants want to answer or, or ask, but... Okay, no, I was just uh, saying there's nothing wrong with the code, right? Because you taught us about this border rank thing, so. Exactly. There was nothing wrong with the code. And I'll just remind everyone why there was nothing wrong with the code. Because if you take a limit of tensors of rank two points on a secant line, you end up on a tangent line. And you will not be in the span of five rank one tensors, 
you'll just be in the limit of such. So there was nothing wrong with his code and he used it, well, first of all, he, dis he discovered or rediscovered, depending on how you want to view it, this notion of border rank. He certainly discovered it in the computer science community. And he also proved that it's a legitimate complexity measure, that the exponent of matrix multiplication is also determined by border rank. Uh, J.M. Wiesmann-Baga, uh, indeed in the chat wrote uh, the right uh, answer, border rank, before you, you, you told yeah, us. Yeah, but that's not fair because he's, an, he's a world expert. So I, <laughs> I, was, I was actually going to say for the quiz that only non-mathematicians should be allowed to answer, or at okay. least a non-expert. But anyway, that's good to know he's uh, here and paying attention. So when I make mistakes, he'll be able to correct me. Okay, so we are on the same page now that this notion of border rank also measures the asymptotic complexity of this matrix multiplication tensor. Now, um, I should point out, now I will answer Edna's question. Although the asymptotic behavior of rank and border rank for matrix multiplication is the same, for individual matrix multiplication tensors, such as two by three, two by two, or three by three, or even 1,000 by 1,000, it's quite possible they could be very different a priori. And I will get to that later in the talk. So if I don't answer your question completely by the end of this talk, ask it again later. But at least now you have two answers that asymptotically there's no difference, but a priori there could be a difference for any fixed size matrix multiplication tensor. Other questions or may I continue? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, and I just- Edina, Edina just- I like staying in a slide with a, a, a picture. So in, in the computer science community, there's this understanding that Multiplying matrices is no difficult than inverting a matrix. Yes, of course. In fact, the way you usually invert a matrix is by using some kind of Gaussian elimination, which is basically by multiplying a few matrices. Sure. In practice, you would not want to use Kramer's rule for large matrices. Right. So, so the reason I point this out is that we saw from Leckheng's Lin talk last time that you can think of inverting a matrix as computing a gradient of the determinant, which itself is can be thought of as a tensor. I mean, there's an underlying tensor for the multilinear polynomial. Is there any connection of the two border ranks or the ranks of these two polynomials? Um, so there's an algorithm for computing determinant that you... Um, use matrix multiplication to do so, and that is the most efficient algorithm. But the direct computation of the determinant in terms of its rank, uh, I don't know of any direct relation because you kind of have to, we, we, we do know other things um, about it, uh, but I don't know any tight relation between those two particular things. Um, Thank you. Car Carlos has a question in the chat. In the so, chat, maybe you answer. Oh, right. Oh, I forgot to tell this story about Bini. So let me let me go back because it's 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 really an amazing story. Bini was telling me that every night he would not be able to sleep because he he could not find the mistake in his code. And it was only one night at three in the morning, he realized that there was nothing wrong with his code. And he realized that there was this notion of border rank all by, you know, by staying up awake at night. So if you cannot sleep because of the problem you're working on, it may not be a bad thing eventually. Okay, I think Jiang Feng has a... Another question by Jiang Feng. Uh, yeah, am, am I my turn? Okay, yeah. So I was actually curious about this issue of uh, like border rank that is a bit of numerical instability. 
So I'm thinking that if you use the Gauss algorithm or perhaps some um, asymptotically optimal algorithm for matrix multiplication, is it possible that we would also face such like numerical instability issues that well, it's very hard to yeah, control the one of errors? Let, let me tell you Beanie's proof, uh, which will answer your question. So like in this picture, I get that vector V by taking one derivative, right? And it's possible that for matrix multiplication, my border rank algorithm might require 100 derivatives. And in which case, so let's, say, let's fix it. So I, I, I have an algorithm for 10 by 10 matrices, but it's very efficient, but it needs 100 derivatives. And um, that is a kind of a problem computationally for that 10 by 10 matrix multiplication computation. But implicit in the very first slide, when I had my matrix whose entries were matrices, you can continue that and you can convert for matrix multiplication, say you need 100 derivatives, then your 10 by your, your border, border rank so-called algorithm for 10 by 10 matrices can for a minor microscopic penalty for 10,000 by 10,000 matrices be converted to an actual rank decomposition. So Beanie is heavily using this self-reproducing property of the matrix multiplication tensor to go from rank to border rank. So he does not need to worry about that issue asymptotically. Now for a fixed size, there are issues. And I would direct you to the work of um, people like Gray Ballard who, have, who, who think about these things uh, much more than I do. <laughs> so um, yeah, other questions? Okay. I have you. All right. So uh, last time somebody asked me a question that I did not answer properly. So I'm going to pay that debt right now because we were just looking at that curve. And um, if I have a curve of rank one matrices, last time I tried to convince you that the fact that its tangent vector was also on a secant line um, was a miracle. And here I just took a curve. I took its derivative at time equal to zero. That gives me a tangent vector to the set of rank one matrices. And it's visibly a rank two matrix. And it is also a tangent vector, a limit of rank two matrices. But if I do the same calculation for tensors, I take a curve of rank one tensors and I take the derivative I get something that looks like the sum of three, and it is actually the sum of three. It cannot be written as a sum of two, a little exercise. And last time, again, I convinced you that the first situation, hopefully I convinced you that the first situation was a miracle and that this second situation is far more typical. So uh, whoever asked me last time, I can pay my debt now. Okay. So I started telling you that when I first heard about this astounding conjecture, I said, that's ridiculous. So I figured I should disprove it. So how are you going to disprove it? So let's fix some border rank R and let's let sigma R be the set of all tensors of border rank at most R. Now in the last talk I explained that here we have good luck because although border rank is defined in terms of limits, it may also be defined algebraically in terms of polynomials. So my, I, not my idea, but just the natural idea how to disprove this conjecture is to find a polynomial on the space of tensors that vanishes, that's in the ideal of sigma r. That is to say, if I have any tensor of border rank at most r and I evaluate the polynomial on it, I get zero. And then we should evaluate it on matrix multiplication and get something non-zero. That would be a proof 
that the border rank of that matrix multiplication tensor is strictly greater than R. So we'd have to do this. So it's a very simple idea. Any questions about this idea? Yeah, I see questions. Yeah, Edina. Please, Edina. Yes, so what are, can you repeat what the generators are for this ideal? I did not tell you what they are. By the end of the talk, I will tell you something of what I know about them. But we just know though, that it is, there are polynomials out there. I didn't say I have them in my pocket. I just said that by general theorem I gave last time, we know there exists polynomials that will describe the set of tensors of border rank at most R as exactly the zero set. Do you have any idea if they look more like a determinant or permanent? Any you will see that you are anticipating what's coming up in this talk. I promise you, I will tell you almost everything I'm allowed to in this lecture. And then I'm scheduled to give a series of additional lectures where I will give the exact details of what I know about those polynomials. Okay, so now, um, even for two by two matrix multiplication, Strassen showed that its border rank is at most seven, although Terracini in 1916 could have told you the same thing, uh, but they weren't talking with each other, even though they didn't live very far apart. Um, even for two by two matrix multiplication, it was not known whether the border rank was uh, seven or six. Strassen did prove that it could not be five, and I will explain his proof later on. But it was not known whether it was seven or six. Now, if you restrict to rank, they learned pretty early on that the rank was indeed seven, but border rank is a more subtle thing, or maybe is less subtle, I don't know, we'll find out. Uh, so this was an open question. And um, the fact that I, I, I point out that in complexity theory, there was spectacular results on sort of getting more and more efficient algorithms for matrix multiplication. Computer scientists are very good at thinking up like brilliant algorithms, but lower bounds, according to uh, the main textbook by Aurora and Barak, it, it, a chapter of their textbook is called Lower Bounds, Complexity Theories Waterloo. And so there had not been much progress. Okay, so let's think about why I was so foolish to think this would be an easy problem. Because let's think about rank at most R matrices well, um, it's invariant. We actually, we know that a matrix is ranked at most R if and only if it's all it's R plus one minors or zero, but let's forget we know that for the moment. Um, it's ideal, the set of polynomials cutting that out is invariant under change of bases. So, so now let's do another quiz. So for rank one matrices, we saw a rank matrix has rank one, if and only if all size two minors are zero. Now, if we look at the space of all homogeneous degree two polynomials on matrices, so I'll denote that space this way, we call this sim two of our vector space, which happens to be tensor product of two vector spaces. Under changes of bases in the first vector space and changes of bases in the second vector space, this decomposes into two pieces. The first piece, which is the product of a homogeneous polynomial in the first set of variables with a product in the second, but it's also the case if you have a skew form on your first and a skew form on the second, the two signs cancel and you get something that becomes a symmetric polynomial. Now, 
The rank one matrix is defined by degree two polynomials. It has to be a set of degree two polynomials that is invariant under changes of bases, invariant under the action of our group GLA cross GLB. So it has to be one of these two vector spaces. Which one is it? Answer is that allowed? Thomas, maybe you want to answer Thomas Bartol, since which of these two spaces is the uh, generates the ideal of the rank one matrices? Ah, oh, come on. I think uh, there is a good uh, answer ah, uh, in the chat. Yeah, but it was, uh, it was, um, I was but still from another, another world expert though. Yeah. Yeah, it's this second one. And how to see that? Well, if I swap two rows of a matrix and take the two by two minor, the sign will change. And if I swap two columns, the sign will change. So this one exactly sees that it's skew in the first and skew in the second, but when you take the two together, you get a polynomial. Okay. So, yeah. All right. So now we can start thinking about tensors. Well, I'm not gonna write it down for you, but you can think about how we would do the same thing on the space of tensors, we can split up these quadratic polynomials. And again, it's not too difficult if you think about it for a little while. And now uh, let's go to rank R tensors. And I want to find similarly a space of invariant polynomials. That is, I want to chop up my homogeneous polynomials of degree D on the space of tensors into irreducible modules, find such a module that's in the ideal. Okay, so as I said, representation theory, oh, I, I give the answer, so uh, here, um, yeah, the, way you get the equations for tensors of border rank at most one is you draw parentheses and you just pretend you're dealing with matrices and you get three sets of polynomials by drawing the parentheses in three different ways. And it turns out that that's enough to cut out the um, rank one tensors. And so notice that the matrices of rank two are defined by polynomials of degree three. The same is true of tensors of border rank at most two. So this gives us cause for optimism because the field of representation theory gives us an algorithm for performing a systematic search by decomposing for any given degree D of polynomials, a way to chop it up into irreducible pieces. And then we just have to write down one representative from each piece test it and see if it works or not to find out if it's an element in the ideal. So Manny Vell, my long-term collaborator and I, uh, this was our first project in this area. And um, we started testing on computers as well as we could back in 2004, given our limited computer skills, which the staff here can attest to, in my case, are extremely limited. Um, we did this systematic search for tensors of border rank at most six on four by four by four tensors, and we did not find any polynomials in the ideal 
of degree less than 12. In fact, we proved that there were no polynomials in the ideal in degree less than 12, which was a rather traumatic event for us. And um, as a consequence, this was basically Laurent's last paper on the subject with me. We wrote one or two more, but uh, we'd been writing papers together all the time and he, he just got fed up after this. Or maybe he was fed up with me, but I, that I don't know, but he certainly was fed up with this result. And then, so a little bit of time goes by and then I happen to have the privilege of working with some amazing postdocs who are who actually know what to do with computers. And they were able to go all the way up uh, in much higher degree. And of course, if you think about the space of homogeneous polynomials of degree 19 in 64 variables, that's a, that's a mighty large vector space. So there's, they're doing some pretty serious computer calculations here. And they found there is nothing in the ideal of degree less than 19. But in degree 19, they found a module in the ideal. But it's too comp the, the polynomial is, was just horrific. Um, we could numerically at that point prove it, but that's not a mathematician's proof that's satisfactory. But fortunately, in degree 20, they found a simpler polynomial because it corresponded to a trivial representation that did work and gave a proof that this border rank of two by two matrix multiplication was indeed seven and not six. Earlier, I had given a different proof using a uh, local differential geometry, uh, doing differential geometry on this uh, variety of border rank six tensors, but that was a, a horrible argument that had no chance of generalizing to higher tensors. On the other hand, this one looks pretty scary also. Questions? Okay, so obviously a systematic bulldozer approach oh, is Adina unlike- has a question. Work. Yeah, yes. so th these methods, do they offer any insight on Scaling, can you scale? Do you see any obstacle or any way to scale these algorithms to say something parametric well, in fact, instead of? In fact, we, we see very clearly that it's not going to scale, that it's, it's just, you know, it, it was kind of a brute force approach for the experts. Basically, we wrote down, um, we decomposed for each degree D our space into irreducible modules. Then for each module, we, we wrote down a highest weight vector and then we tested it on a random point of the Segre variety and okay. got non-zero and that's a certificate that it's not in the ideal. So that is not going to scale. And so what we need is to be a little bit more clever and to use some tricks rather than a bulldozer approach, we need to think a little bit which is what we should be doing if we're mathematicians, uh, hopefully. So, so um, we can trade off the study of tensors to the study of linear subspaces of matrices. So you don't get one matrix, but a whole vector space of matrices by just taking the image of the induced linear map. Right, we could think of a tensor as a linear map from our vector space C to the vector C dual to a tensor B. And I can look at the image of that map. Hopefully it's injective. And um, then we can recover as far as change up to change of basis, our original tensor from that image. Now, <coughs> this is a linear map from the dual of A to B. And we don't know so much about such spaces of such. But if we instead had a space of endomorphisms, a map from a vector space to itself, our lives would be a little better. So let's assume there's an element of full rank, which we can use to... Um, as a map from B star to A, we can take its inverse. And by taking its inverse and composing with all the other maps, 
that one becomes the identity map on A and all the others become maps from A to itself. That's what I wrote down here. And we get a space of endomorphisms. Now, it's clear that if the rank of my tensor, well, if I have an n-dimensional space of simultaneously diagonalizable matrices, then I could take the basis, the elements on the diagonal, and the associated tensor would have rank n, because I just have one, one, one. Each of those things are rank one on the diagonal. And it, this is an if and only if statement. The rank of my tensor is n, if and only if this image corresponds to an n-dimensional space of diagonal endomorphisms. Now, this looks great because it reduces us from the world of tensors to the world of classical linear algebra. This is a, this is a problem that was studied in the 1960s and maybe, and I mean, studied long ago, studied hundred years ago. And um, we're interested in something a little bit more subtle, namely border rank N, in which case we need to take a limit, a limit in the Grossmannian sense of n-dimensional space of diagonal endomorphisms to get border rank N. Great news, this question was also studied in classical linear algebra. And I know this one was at least studied in the 1960s, if not earlier. There's paper by Gerstenhaber on this. But it's open question in the linear algebra world as well. So good news, we reduced to something studied classical. Bad news is that classical question is still open today. Okay, but let's not, so let's try for something a little bit easier. Well, if the matrices are simultaneously diagonalizable, then there's certainly, ne it's necessary that they must commute. And the good news is it's very easy to test if two matrices are co commute. It's degree two polynomial, they're commutator. And even better, and this is due to, Stra this whole idea is due to Strassen that I'm describing, in 1983, you can upgrade this to tests for higher border rank than minimal. Namely, the border rank of your tensor is n plus, is at least n plus the rank of whatever that commutator is. And using that, he was able to prove the first non-trivial lower bound for the border rank of the matrix multiplication tensor in 1983. Questions. So Strassen proved this lower bound by translating the question about tensors to a question about spaces of matrices, found some polynomials on the space of matrices, and showed that the matrix multiplication tensor did not satisfy those polynomials. So he got the best possible lower bound he could with this trick. Question. Lisa Dina. Yes. So I wanted to know, is it clear that this family of commuting simultaneously diagonalizable matrices is the easiest one for which one could actually make this argument? I'm not sure I understand the question. So if I was, for example, looking at upper triangular matrices. Sorry? So if you make an argument on tridiagonal matrices, other structured matrices, could you push through an argument like this? Well. The, the point is we don't want to do that because we want to only look at properties that are invariant under change of bases. And being tri-diagonalizable, I guess, is invariant under change of bases, but it's a, it, it sounds like a very subtle property. So we really want to think about things that are invariant under changes of bases. Okay, and you know, uh, the advisor hits a home run, the student gets to go to second base for free. Uh, a slight variant due to Lichtig uh, improves the error term in 1985. 
And then a uh, long time passed, and then there was no further progress on lower bounds other than for the two by two case, which I described for you. And so let's think about what Strassen did. Strassen found his equations by mapping his space of tensors to a space of matrices and found equations by taking minors. This is a classical thing people do in algebraic geometry. They study uh, degeneracy loci of maps between vector bundles. You don't need to know what those words mean. But anyway, there's a long history in algebraic geometry of doing this kind of thing. Oh, so then the, um, moder the moderator of this session and his collaborator used this classical trick in algebraic geometry to get the first new lower bound that since 1985, so that three halves was upgraded to a two using this trick. So, um, but these equations were not found haphazardly or not found by, like Strassen was very clever. We are maybe not so clever, so we used representation theory to help us. And representation theory allowed us just as you could do systematic search for polynomials, you could also do systematic search for um, equivariant maps to spaces of matrices, to, to tensor products of modules for this group. And it just so happened, one of the simplest things we found uh, as a map, as an equivariant map to a space of big matrices did the job. Maybe for the experts, I'll say a little bit more about that. The space of matrices was the maps from the pth exterior power of A tensor B dual to the P plus first exterior power of A tensor C. And the formula for the map is quite simple. Don't worry about this formula if you're not used to this notation. It's just for people who know it. The point is, though, that it's very concrete, very explicit, and we get some large matrix that we can take the ranks of and get lower bounds. So the punchline is we found equations by exploiting symmetry of the variety of tensors of border rank at most R. And we use that plus some tricks to find polynomials in the ideal. Questions? Okay. Now, some bad news. We were excited, but uh, we were not able to do much new, do better than that. And we were wondering why. And then um, a remarkable pair of papers, well, a, a remarkable confluence happened, one in the world of complexity theory and one in the world of algebraic geometry said that game is basically over for this kind of trick of mapping your space into a space of matrices. Just a word for the experts, uh, determinantal methods detect zero dimensional schemes and what we want are zero dimensional smoothable schemes. For those of you who are not experts, basically it's what it's saying is any polynomial you find by taking a minor of matrices is actually going to not only vanish on the set of tensors of border rank at most R, but it's going to vanish on a set that's strictly larger once R is bigger than uh, six times your dimension of your vector space. So in particular, if I have a tensor in, um, I switched notation, sorry, I have a tensor in CM tensor CM tensor CM, in our case, M is N squared, you can never show a bound better than 6M or 6N squared in the case of matrix multiplication. It just will never happen using such techniques. So this is a barrier to future progress that needs to be overcome. Okay, but let's forget about that barrier for the moment and let's just turn ahead and do what we can. So, so far, 
all I've talked about is the symmetry of the set of tensors of border rank at most R. But we're not, well, we could be interested in that object, but we're also interested in a particular point, the matrix multiplication tensor. And it also has symmetry. Um, remember, if you have a tensor, you can define its symmetry group by the change of bases in each of the three vector spaces that don't change your tensor. And it turns out that the matrix multiplication tensor, so here GLA is GLN squared because it's acting on an N squared dimensional vector space. And inside there, the matrices is an N by N matrix and there's a copy of little GLN, change of bases in N variables three times sitting inside the symmetry group of the matrix multiplication tensor sitting inside the symmetry group of the Segre variety. And as a, I might as well prove at least something this lecture, the trace of X times Y times Z is the same as the trace when I hit conjugate X, Y, and Z by these matrices. Okay, so there's one proof in this lecture. Okay, so how are we gonna exploit the symmetry group of a tensor? So, if I have a tensor of border rank at most R, then I have a bunch of R points that are maybe crashing into each other or moving around. But each time these, I, at each moment of time, these R points will span an R plane. And in the limit, there will be a limiting R plane. And my tensor will lie on that limiting R plane. So, that is to say there's a curve in the Grossmannian such that at every time non-zero, that R plane is spanned by my R points that are rank one tensors. And at time zero, the limiting R plane contains R tensor. So this is just a slight change on perspective about what it means to have border rank at most R. We're gonna deal with this auxiliary space, this Grossmannian, this is just the space of R planes through the origin in our vector space. The reason I need to introduce this new geometric object is because I wanna work in a compact space so I know I will be able to take limits and I can and I will. Now, say we have such a decomposition a border rank decomposition. Well, then if our, if our tensor, such as matrix multiplication has non-trivial symmetry, then I don't just get one border rank decomposition, but I get a whole bunch of them, one for each element of the group because I can move it around. And so if we want to show that there does not exist a border rank decomposition, we can just show that there does not exist a lot of them. So we can insist on normalized curves. And um, there's a classical lower bound technique called the substitution method, which I don't want to go into, but applying that classical technique plus this symmetry so for if we're if we're dealing with matrix multiplication, uh, we can insist that the upper triangular matrices do not move that limiting R plane, that it's a fixed point. And so there's not so many possible candidates when you have that. And then you can test by this classical method those candidates. And we were able to improve the lower bound, improve the error term from n to log n. So that's progress. And that's fairly recent. And like I said, this um, method will not uh, overcome the barrier, but we get a bonus. This method is versatile. And um, I think I mentioned the hay in the haystack problem uh, before. Let me, yeah, I have 15 minutes, right? Right. 
Yeah. So then I, I tell you about the hay in the haystack problem again. So recall that a random tensor will have border rank around MQ, M squared over three. And yet there are no explicit in the sense of computer science sequences of tensors that provably have border rank M to the one plus epsilon. So you should be able to get something close to M squared. They can't even get super linear sequence. Um, and explicit is a very precise term. Basically it means uh, you can produce the sequence with an arithmetic circuit, uh, something like that, of polynomial size. Okay, so um, previously the most best hay in a haystack solution was that earlier result with Ottaviani applied to the matrix multiplication tensor, which is very far from a random tensor, I point out, to get this 2m minus square root of m, because m is n squared. That's just restating the result. But using this new technology, uh, Michałek and I finally were able to bait 2m. So 2m seemed to be the like something we didn't know how to surpass, and we got 2.03m uh, with a lot of work. But that idea. But again, you know, this method cannot go much further because it's subject to exactly the same barriers I talked about for the, for the determinantal methods. Questions? Okay, mm -hmm. so now there was something very exciting, at least very exciting for me, from the Buczynski family. Uh, Buczynska Buczynski is a married couple uh, I hope their kids also do great math, but they're doing fantastic math. So I don't want to go into detail about their great idea because I will do that in my seminar talks, but let me give you the idea. So in classical algebraic geometry, we study geometric objects. But around the 1950s, there was a, someone who worked in functional analysis by the name of Grothendieck decided to work in algebraic geometry. And he imported ideas from functional analysis where you probe a space by studying the functions on it to algebraic geometry. And he shifted the focus of algebraic geometry from the, the object to the ideal of polynomials defining it. Now, of course, that was already happening before him, but he, he gave a, a large formalism to shift this thing from the geometric object to the ideal of polynomials that described it. And so now if we have a border rank decomposition, before I told you, we have these points moving around. And I said, well, let's not look at the points, but let's look at their span to give us some uh, curve in Grossmannian. The Buczynski family upped the ante significantly. And they said, well, let's not just look at that, but let's look at the entire curve of ideals we get. Because if we have R distinct points, we could look at all the polynomials vanishing on those R points. We get an ideal. And then, we could take the limit as t goes to zero of the limiting ideal. And now you may say, well, what do you mean by limiting ideal? You need to have some compact space that you take limits in. And fortunately, there's this um, sophisticated object called the heyman sturmfels multigraded Hilbert scheme, which generalizes, which is a variant of the Hilbert scheme that was defined by Grothendieck that allows you exactly to take limits. You could think of this heyman sturmfels uh, multigraded Hilbert scheme as living in some product of, importantly, a finite number of Grossmannians. And so uh, that's what they do. And it gave rise to something called the border apolarity method. So you have this tensor, it's a limit. And now we look at the ideal that's a limit of the ideals of these points. And again, we can insist 
that the limiting ideal is Borel fixed, that is fixed by these triples of upper triangular matrices in the case of matrix multiplication. And now we're reduced to a small search in each multi-degree. So instead of having a single curve in a single Grossmannian, we get what looks like an infinite number of curves in an infinite number of Grossmannians, but there's a theorem, uh, Caswell Nova Mumford regularity that says you only need to look at a finite number of these Grossmannians because stabilization occurs uh, at a certain point. And so now you have all these compatibility conditions that can be exploited to prove lower bounds. Now, um, the upshot is that this algorithm either produces all normalized candidate ideals or proves your tensor has border rank greater than R. And this has led to significant progress on many border rank problems. Now, I don't want to go into exactly the nature of the progress because it's harder to state the results, but you just have to trust me or come to my uh, seminar lecture and I'll be very precise about what was proven, that this is a real major breakthrough. The other thing I want to say is that this off the shelf application of border apolarity is still subject to the barriers I talked about before, but now we have a path to overcoming those barriers by using some rather sophisticated algebraic geometry that is in the course of being developed. Namely, um, we have a lot more information now. We have not just a point in a Grossmannian, but we have a, an, a limiting ideal. And we can see in the multigraded Hilbert scheme, hopefully we want to distinguish the good ideals, the ones that are actually limits of our points, and the bad ones, which this will also produce, uh, we need to separate those, and that is work in progress. Now, um, yeah, so I could either stop here or say a few more words about some other open problems. I have seven minutes, so maybe I at least say a few words. So let's skip that. Um, I talked about this, there's a, a, a important open problem in complexity theory of finding equations of tensors of minimal border rank. Um, the state of the art of that is rather embarrassing. So border rank M and CM, 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 we assume the tensor is concise. The state of the art of that is really embarrassing. Uh, Schmuel Friedland in 2010 has the best result. Uh, he got a salmon out of it, but that's another day, story for another time. Um, you could be even more ambitious uh, in the spirit of algebraic geometry and ask for generators of the ideal of tensors of minimal border rank. And that's only known for M uh, up to three. Um, and now I'm gonna shift gears completely and talk about um, quantum information theory and talk about a little bit about something I wanted to talk about last time and I ran out of time. So the approx so quantum information theory, you, you have cost and value. You wanna know how good is your tensor or how entangled is your tensor. The more entangled it is, the more valuable it is to you. And so the approximate cost of your tensor is given by the border rank. And the approximate value is given by the border sub rank. So the border rank, we wanted to express our tensor. Uh, we had this like identity looking tensor and the border rank of the tensor was the largest identity looking like tensor that you could degenerate to your tensor. And the border sub rank is the, sorry, the border rank is the smallest identity like tensor that you can degenerate to your tensor. And the border sub rank is the largest identity-like tensor that you can degenerate your tensor into that identity-like tensor. I talked about these quantities last time. 
And to get the true cost and value in the sense of quantum information theory, you have to work asymptotically. So you take some very large tensor power of your tensor, and then you take this normalized limit um, called the asymptotic rank or asymptotic border rank, they coincide uh, by taking this large tensor power, computing the border rank and then normalizing it uh, by dividing by N and similarly for the sub rank. And um, there's been some very exciting work of Kristen Dahl, Brana and Zwiedem, uh compare about these quantities and relating these quantities to many other concepts. Uh, so, as I saw when I first saw this um, matrix multiplication problem and border rank, I was like, this is great. Algebraic geometers have been studying this stuff for over 100 years. I could just profit of all the hard work and brilliant insights of these algebraic geometers who came before to prove stuff about border rank. But these sub rank and border sub rank are not obviously related to classically studied objects. But recently there's been some exciting work that um, computes. So I gave you a list of like seven or 10 different notions of uh, rank generalization of rank of matrices to rank of tensors in the first lecture. And um, I said that, you know, uh, what I didn't say is there's even more. And a few more were defined probably because people could not understand this border sub rank. So uh, Terence Tao defined this slice rank, and then that was generalized to something called strength or product rank for higher order tensors. And these are very active areas of research that hopefully will get mentioned later in the program. Uh, because they are related to random tensors and analytic rank and things over finite field. Um, and uh, if you want to study random tensors, the conjecture or the theorem of Gowers is that low product rank implies bias. I know I will finish on time. And very, very, very recently, there's an exciting paper that proves the converse that essentially says that the, the bias of a tensor is detectable with its product rank. So this is really recent work and, and great stuff uh, that brings together quantum information theory, geometry, probability, analysis. I mean, so I, I'm just dropping some words on you so you know that there's some very recent, and like I'm talking about a month ago, February, uh, stuff that's come out. Um, yeah. And I want to finish on time. So I'll just point out that some variants of this do turn out unexpectedly to be related to classical algebraic geometry. Namely, um, we look at linear spaces in the space of M by M matrices, and we want to study linear spaces having non-transverse intersections with the rank at most R matrices. And now I thank you for your attention. Oh, no, uh, yes, now I thank you for your attention.